Welcome back everyone, this is part 13 of the biggest f unsolved mysteries iceberg created by Jimbo Seth. It's got over a thousand entries spanning across over a dozen different subgenres and I'll link the previous 12 parts for you in the description in case you're new. So without further ado, let's continue. Granger Taylor was the name of a 32-year-old man who disappeared in 1980, and one of the final things that Granger left behind before going missing was a life-size model of a UFO that he built in the backyard of his family's property. No one was quite sure why Granger suddenly went missing. Was it because of an accident, foul play, or did he just simply run off? Well, after Granger's family contacted authorities, his stepfather found a handwritten note inside of Granger's room. The note said the following. Dear Mother and Father, I have gone away to walk aboard an alien spaceship. As recurring dreams assured a 42-month interstellar voyage to explore the vast universe, then return. I am leaving behind all my possessions to you as I will no longer require the use of any. Please use the instructions in my will as a guide to help. Love, Granger. And as those 42 months went by, there was no sign of Granger. And inside of that will that was mentioned in the letter, there were two notable changes. The specific words funeral and death were oddly replaced by departure. And there really weren't many signs of the missing man until over a decade later in 1986. There were some adult human bones as well as fragments of a truck discovered at a blast site on Mount Prevost that a coroner determined to belong to Granger. But it should be mentioned that some people are of the opinion that this conclusion was not definitively established since DNA testing wasn't a mainstay in this particular investigation. But this next detail might sell you on the idea that this was Granger. Strewn around the bones were pieces of clothing that were later confirmed to belong to a shirt that Granger owned. In fact, those shreds of clothing were part of a shirt that Granger's mother had sewn herself. The truck fragments were also confirmed to belong to Granger's vehicle, and the coroner's office officially declared Granger to be dead. So for many, this case is just sort of open and shut, but some of his friends and family were not satisfied with this outcome. For example, one of his close friends was really fighting hard to say that the evidence was not conclusive. And then of course, there are those alien enthusiasts that believe Granger actually did make contact with aliens and he was actually kidnapped by the government and then transported to Area 51. There's just no end to the conspiracy theories for this particular case, and some even believe that Granger is still alive out there. His official cause of death was listed as massive injuries due to the consequence of an explosion. According to Granger's sister, Granger's interest with space travel truly began around 1977 with the arrival of Star Wars, which birthed the idea of building that UFO we mentioned earlier. His family described it as a sort of fortress complete with a wood stove and sleeping area. Initially, Granger's friends and family simply thought of this as a fun project, but once Granger said he wanted to build a radio to communicate with aliens due to a recurring dream he had, many began to worry about his well-being. One of Granger's close childhood friends named Keller was adamant that he was mentally healthy and had no intentions of harming himself. But as many people are aware of, victims of poor mental health often hide it from their loved ones. Granger's parents, Jim and Grace, left their back door unlocked for years in hopes that Granger would one day just return to them. The most logical theory to explain things seems to be that Granger really believed he was going on a trip with aliens into space. On the night that Granger disappeared, he made a stop at a restaurant called Bob's Grill before stopping at Mount Prevost, where several residents reported hearing a loud boom that lined up with the time it would have taken Granger to get to the mountain. Now, this particular night had extremely bad weather, so that boom could very well have just been thunder, or it could have been the sound of his truck exploding. Investigators did learn from Granger's mother that he did have access to dynamite. His friend Keller mentioned that Granger told him aliens would only come by when the weather was bad in order to cover up their tracks. So in conclusion, most people believe that Granger simply blew up in the explosion while up at the mountains. Whether or not he was intentionally in the blast radius, we can't know for sure. And then there's the question of why he even blew up his truck. Did he think that the explosion was some sort of beacon to tell the aliens that he was ready? Again, we don't really know for sure, we're just guessing. And before we end this entry, there are a couple other possibilities that I would like to mention. I saw a few posts online that mentioned that Granger may have been tricked into doing this by some really bad people. Similar to another case that we went over earlier in the iceberg, there were these guys in Brazil that went through this really strange ritual to get into contact with aliens. 
They brought along valuables such as cash, and when they completed the routine that they were told to do, they were killed and then stripped of everything that they brought along. I'm not entirely sure what Granger brought along with him on this journey to the mountain, but it's definitely possible that he was just coerced into this. And this is actually a pretty common scam around the world. Before we continue, I'd like to introduce today's sponsor, Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that allows for members to reimagine the way they explore and experience fragrances. Fragrances are a very important aspect of my daily life. If I don't enjoy the aroma I carry, it hinders my productivity for the day. That's why it's extremely important that I always have easy access to different scents. Scentbird sends you a new designer fragrance of your choice every month for just $17. They carry brands such as Gucci, Prada, Versace, as well as indie labels such as Skylar, Heretic, and many more. With each scent, you get a 30-day supply, allowing you to try out several different ones without having to commit to a full-size bottle, often costing hundreds of dollars. And for a limited time, you can use my code Don't Look At Me at checkout to get 55% off of your first month at Scentbird. This month, I received African Ruibos by Chris Collins, which carries a blend of spicy black pepper, warm cardamom, and bright bergamot to create a lively and earthy aroma. I also got House of Bow, which is a captivating and sultry white floral essence with notes of the seawater transporting you to an untouched corner in Mexico's Riviera. And finally, I also got Frustration from Etat Liberdange, which carries a dominion of vanilla, rum, and vetiver. Whichever fragrance you choose, you will get a convenient carrying case that allows you to easily swap out and snap in any of your scentbird aromas. Again, make sure to take advantage of this limited time offer by using my code don't look at me at checkout to get 55% off of your first month at Scentbird. Thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring the video. In the year 1982, an unidentified man began terrorizing New York City by sending packages to unsuspecting citizens, which shot off bullets in three different directions. The bomber's first victim was a 54-year-old woman named Joanne Betty Kipp, who worked as a guidance counselor for a local high school. It was May 7th when Joanne was getting ready to leave New York with her husband for a Mother's Day trip when she got a last-minute package in the mail. She was told that the package was a cookbook, which Joanne thought was a surprise Mother's Day gift. So she opened up the box eagerly, but when she examined the book, she was shot by a gun. She was rushed to a hospital, but unfortunately, she didn't survive and died only hours later. An entire decade went by without another incident from the bomber. Between 1993 and 1996, he sent out four more packages. On October 15, 1993, a sanitation worker named Anthony Lenza and his wife were returning from their vacation in Pennsylvania. Their children decided to visit them and picked up their mail when they arrived at their home. One of the packages they picked up carried a medallion which, when opened, shot Anthony Anthony and two of his relatives, but unlike our first incident, all three of the victims would survive. On April 5th, 1994, 75-year-old Alice Caswell was shot but not killed by another box with a medallion that was similar in design as the one Anthony received. This particular package wasn't even meant for her though. It was actually addressed to her brother, Richard McGarrell. The next target was 18-year-old Stephanie Gaffney, who was eight months pregnant. It was June 27, 1995 when she picked up her mail and discovered a surprise package. Inside the box was a book which when opened shot three bullets. Her baby wasn't immediately harmed, but it was in distress, so doctors induced a labor and Stephanie was able to give birth to a healthy girl. Later on, police informed the public that if she had not held the book at an angle, she would likely have not survived the shots. The final package was sent on June 20th, 1996, which was received by 77-year-old real estate agent Richard Basile. This package had a cassette tape which exploded when interacted with. Richard fortunately survived his encounter with the bomber though. Throughout the duration of the quote-unquote bombings, police were not able to determine whether these packages were sent at random or if the victims were chosen for specific reasons. A man named Stephen Wavra and one of his close friends are two of the more notable suspects. They were seen creating devices that were shoved inside books that resembled bombs. Furthermore, the first victim, Joanne, was his guidance counselor. Stephen supposedly also had had loose connections to the other victims. There were several other suspects including Joanne's own husband, Harold, and her son, Craig. So three months 
after Joanne passed away, her 28-year-old son was actually charged with her death. The writing in the package, as well as Craig's own, were analyzed by a handwriting specialist and they were said to be strikingly similar. But those charges against Craig were later dropped down the line. Charlie Chopoff is the nickname given to an unidentified serial killer from the 1970s that's known for killing at least four children in Manhattan. And it seems that the culprit was racially motivated, with three of the children being black and one was Puerto Rican. All of the victims were male and part of their lower body had been mutilated or removed entirely. The known victims were 8-year-old Douglas Owens, 9-year-old Wendell Hubbard, 9-year-old Luis Ortiz, 8-year-old Stephen Cropper, and a 10-year-old who went unnamed as requested by his family. And this 10-year-old actually survived his encounter with the killer. On March 9, 1972, 8-year-old Douglas Owens went missing while running errands for his mother. Douglas's mother grew concerned when he didn't return home and a search party was formed immediately after the call to the police. The group would find Douglas, however, they were too late. Douglas had been stabbed 38 times before being left on a rooftop of a building on East 121st Street, which was just two blocks away from where he lived. Furthermore, a portion of his lower body was mutilated. Due to this, many investigators thought that the crime was personal and suspected that a relative or friend of Douglas's family was responsible. But unfortunately, authorities faced a dead end due to the lack of witnesses and evidence. In the same year, 9-year-old Wendell Hubbard as well as the unnamed victim who was 10 years old were also assaulted. Wendell disappeared while playing out in his yard. His mother called out for him to come back home, but when she didn't get a response in return, she immediately contacted the police. After several hours of searching, the police found Wendell's lifeless body on the rooftop of the apartment he lived in. Wendell had sustained 17 stab wounds and his lower body was mutilated as well. Additionally, the location of this apartment was only 6 blocks away from where Douglas was found. As for the unnamed victim, he was abducted on a rainy day while running errands for his parents. He was assaulted and stabbed, but unlike the other victims, he just had his genitals completely removed instead of just being mutilated. And shockingly, he somehow survived. But due to all the trauma he went through, he was unable to remember any critical details about the culprit. However, police were able to develop a vague description of the guy from various witnesses. The suspect looked to be Spanish or Italian, had a mole on his cheek, was rather thin and possibly walked with a limp. Nine-year-old Luis Ortiz went missing in 1973 after visiting a grocery store for milk and bread. After his parents noticed that he was gone for way too long, he was reported missing and ultimately he was found, but as you guys can probably guess, it was too late. Luis had been stabbed over 30 times, but this time there were many more witnesses resulting in the development of a composite sketch. Luis's family returned to their home in Puerto Rico shortly after their loss. The 8-year-old named Stephen Cropper was found 5 months after Luis, but unlike the other victims, Stephen was cut with a razor blade instead of being stabbed with a knife. He was not mutilated anywhere in his lower body, but due to the manner in which his body was found, investigators concluded that he was assaulted and likely a victim of the same killer. Over 150 suspects were interviewed after the death of Luis Ortiz alone, and around this time is when other kids started spreading rumors about the killer where they would refer to him as Charlie Chopoff. The search really began to heat up after Stephen's death, which resulted in the apprehension of a man only known as El Gonzalez. It was reported by several witnesses that Gonzalez was hanging around areas where the abductions had taken place. The public was understandably desperate to see the culprit face justice, so as Gonzalez was about to be freed, a mob of protesters gathered around the police facility. They were convinced that Gonzalez was indeed the killer. Police had to sneak Gonzalez out of the station, so they formed barricades around the building. This didn't do much, however, as the public began climbing over the walls to get to the suspected culprit. In the end, Gonzalez was safely transported out after he was changed into a large police uniform. Another suspect that the community had their eyes on was chased out of town and into a river. There was also a man named Daniel Olivo who was charged with assaulting a 5-year-old boy a few weeks after Stephen's murder. And although he did fit the suspect's profile, he was dismissed as a suspect due to his MO not matching up with the killer. There were many, many other suspects as time went on, but none were proven to be tied to the boys. Another of the more notable suspects was named Erno Soto who confessed to officers that he stalked young black boys in his neighborhood and even confessed to the murder of Stephen. Police brought him in and lined him up along with a bunch of other suspects to show the unnamed victim who survived. 
The boy said Erno looked somewhat familiar and could definitely have been the guy, but police did not view his statements as conclusive. The Nazca Lines are a collection of giant ancient geoglyphs located in the Peruvian coastal plain created between 500 BC and 500 AD. As recent as December of 2022, over a hundred new glyphs have been discovered by a research group from Yamagata University. The designs themselves can range quite drastically from being a pretty mundane animal to strange mythical looking humanoid figures. And then there's the two giant designs of a spider and a bird that most people probably recognize. The straight lines of some of these designs can even stretch out to 30 miles in length. The Nazca lines were only discovered when explorers traversed the hills overlooking the glyphs. The sheer magnitude of them have led some to believe that aliens were responsible for their creation. But understandably, much of the public is not fond of this particular idea. So then why exactly did people make these massive glyphs in the ground? Some geologists are fond of the theory that these lines are a sort of astronomical calendar, while other researchers believe the glyphs to have been some sort of ceremonial walkway or serve some religious purpose. One of the researchers from Yamagata University is sold on the idea that these lines and designs were a form of navigation or communication. To make an illustration, many of the straight lines actually lead to other valleys, while animal designs on hills for example could have been a way to tell people that this animal lives there. This can also double as a warning for poisonous animals such as snakes. Some could have also been landmarks telling travelers where they were. And before we end the entry, I would like to circle back to the religion theory. And very quickly before we end the entry, I would like to circle back to the religion theory. Since the culture around the area evolved throughout time, it may have been possible that the purpose of the lines also changed. At first, they could very well have been used for communication, while later on, those larger, more famous ones were a sort of tribute or shrine to the gods. The Baikal seal is the only species of seal in the world that resides in fresh water. And as you can probably guess from the name, the seal is only found in Lake Baikal, located in Siberia. This species of seal are able to hunt, breed, and live a comfortable life within that single body of water. But the strange thing is, this lake is completely surrounded by mountains and is a long distance away from the closest sea. So how exactly did these seals get to this lake? So first off, it's not exactly a brand new idea where seals are only found within one isolated body of water. The Caspian seal is another species that is unable to get to other bodies of water without traveling through a lot of land. And it is with the Caspian seal that we might have our answer. Scientists suggest that one of the possible reasons that the Baikal seal was able to get to the lake was due to flooding caused by many glaciers melting. This excess water may have allowed the seals to travel through northern Russia and ultimately reach the lake. Another theory says that over 5 million years ago, the Caspian and Black Sea were combined to form one. This combined sea may have contained a special pathway that interconnected it to other oceans. But as the seas were divided over the millions of years, the seals in the area were separated and evolved into a completely different species. Back in December 2014, a group of about four to six masked men bursted into the Red Bull Racing's base at 1.30 a.m. and stole about 60 trophies. A silver vehicle was used to ram into the entrance of the building before being followed by a dark colored Mercedes. The team principal, Christian Horner, was heartbroken and shocked as to why the thieves chose to steal those particular trophies as he said they don't hold much, if any, market value. The nighttime security was not hurt, but the break-in caused significant damage. In 2015, four members of a gang were suspected of being involved and when arrested then questioned, it was realized that they were indeed the culprits. The men were Danny Stevens, Paul Smith, Jason Eastwood, and Luke Cole. The ages of the men ranged from the youngest being 24 and the oldest being 41. The theft on the Red Bull facility was estimated to be valued at about 94,000 pounds or about 120,000 US dollars. The raid itself was said to have caused well over 300,000 pounds in damage which is over 380,000 in USD. During their interrogation, it was learned that they dumped about 20 of the trophies at Horseshoe Lake, which were all retrieved. But as for the remaining 40, their whereabouts are unknown. The group also admitted to being responsible for approximately 40 other burglaries and thefts across southern England from November 2014 to April 2015. 
Three out of the four thieves were arrested at a farm in Berkshire where police discovered gas cylinders and remote ignition devices which were used to blow open the cash machines which the group stole. So while the identities of the culprits have been revealed and some of the trophies retrieved, it is still unknown as to what had happened to the rest of the trophies. Albert Einstein passed away in April of 1955 after a blood vessel near his heart bursted open. His health was slowly deteriorating once he hit his 70s, but he did not seem to really care. When his doctors informed him that an artery of his might develop an aneurysm which could burst, he simply said, let it burst. Einstein was taken to the Princeton Hospital in New Jersey where nurse Alberta Roswell was caring for him. Around midnight on the 18th of April, Alberta noticed that Einstein was having issues with his breathing. Alberta did not know it at the time, but the following moments were going to be Einstein's last. He muttered something to Alberta, but unfortunately, she could not understand what was being said since Einstein was speaking in German. After uttering his last words, he took a couple deep breaths before finally dying. And there really aren't any theories behind this because he literally could have said anything. Anybody's guess is as good as the next. But before his last moments when he was offered surgery, Einstein refused, saying, I want to go when I want. It is tasteless to prolong life artificially. I have done my share. It is time to go. I will do it elegantly. Afterwards, Einstein's body was cremated as per his request. Bible John is the name given to an unidentified serial killer who has killed at least three women in the late 1960s in Glasgow, Scotland. The women were named Helen Patak, Jemima McDonald, and Patricia Docker, and the cases involving them have gone down as one of the largest murder hunts Scotland has ever seen. All three murder victims shared similar characteristics such as the fact that they were all menstruating, strangled, had their handbags stolen, and were all visiting the same location prior to their deaths. It is said that Bible John consistently quoted from the Bible and went on tirades about adultery before killing each of his victims. Bible John garnered a large-scale police investigation, however, despite this and the overwhelming public interest, the culprit has never been identified. Patricia was a 25-year-old nurse who worked in Glasgow, and one evening she decided to go out for a night of dancing. Patricia spent the night visiting several different ballrooms before entering the Barrel Land Ballroom, which will be an important location in all of the murders. What exactly happened for the rest of the night after Patricia entered this particular ballroom is unknown, but it's widely assumed that this is where she met Bible John. Patricia failed to return home that night, and on the following morning, her parents contacted police to report that Patricia had gone missing. Before police could even really start looking, a man who was on his way to work stumbled upon Patricia's lifeless body, which was only a few blocks away from her home. Patricia had been assaulted and was found wearing nothing but a single shoe. According to officials, her cause of death was strangulation, but she had also been punched and kicked around her face and body. Some witnesses informed police that they saw Patricia with a pretty attractive man who had red hair, but police were never able to identify anyone who fit that description. Patricia's handbag, which was missing at first, was found later that day, but her clothes and jewelry remained missing. Jemima McDonald was a 32-year-old mother of three who also decided to visit the Barrel Land Ballroom one night. Jemima was seen having an enthusiastic conversation with a six-foot-tall, dark-haired man who was in his mid to late 20s or early 30s. She was seen leaving the ballroom with the man a little past midnight in the direction of her home. That night, Jemima had her sister Margaret watching the kids, and when it was getting late and Jemima still wasn't home, Margaret got a bit worried. About a day later, Margaret began to hear some rumors from the neighborhood kids about a dead body lying in a rundown building. Margaret was both worried and intrigued, so she decided to pass by the place herself. And to her horror, the rumors were true, but not just that. The naked and dead body was in fact her sister, Jemima. Police stated that Jemima was beaten and assaulted before being strangled to death. Furthermore, they believed that Jemima's body had been lying there for at least one day. At this point, police hadn't connected the two murders yet, but after extensive investigation into both cases, authorities did eventually suspect that a single person was responsible for both murders. And this is due to the similarities that we spoke of at the beginning between the two victims. They were both assaulted before being strangled to death, were menstruating, had their handbags stolen, and visited the same location before being murdered. The police interviewed hundreds of suspects and even sent undercover agents into that ballroom. 
Helen Patak was the final victim and was killed in October of 1969. Helen and her sister Jean both visited the Barrowland Ballroom on a Saturday night where they joined up with two men, and both of those men introduced themselves as John. Jean later informed authorities that one of the Johns went berserk when a cigarette machine took his money and failed to dispense any cigarettes, and it was because of this particular event that the employees of the ballroom came over and were able to get a better description of the man. The group of four left the ballroom after about an hour of talking, and one of the Johns decided to take a bus home while the two girls and the second John took a cab together. Jean was the next to depart from the group. And according to the taxi driver, he wasn't too familiar with the area, so Helen eventually left as well due to frustration. John then followed Helen out of the vehicle, and the driver simply thought that the two were a couple, so he let them be. And that was the very last time Helen was ever seen alive. Helen was found the next day dead in her garden by a man walking his dog. She also went through the exact same things as Jemima and Patricia. As I mentioned earlier, hundreds of suspects were interviewed, but one of the more notable guys was named Peter Tobin. Peter was found guilty of murdering three young women and had been in prison in the past for raping two minors. After he was released from prison, he went on to kill another woman named Angelica when he was working in the St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church. Angelica was raped, beaten, and stabbed. He served another 21 years in prison due to this murder, and during the sentence is when police suspected that Peter may have been involved in other murders, namely the ones by Bible John. But to keep things short, there is no hard evidence that proves he is this killer. However, to most investigators, he is one of the more viable suspects. Melon heads are these creatures described as being small with massive bulbous heads. Typically, they like to hide and stay away from people, but are known for occasionally jumping out and attacking pedestrians. Sightings of melon heads are most commonly reported in Michigan, Connecticut, and of course, Ohio. And depending on the location, the urban legend may differ a bit. In the Michigan version, melon heads are said to primarily wander around Felt Mansion. Legend has it the melon heads were originally children with hydrocephalus who lived nearby. After suffering extreme physical and emotional abuse, they became feral and were outcast into the forest. Supposedly, there was a doctor in the area that was the primary abuser, so the melon heads abducted and killed him. And in order to hide the body, they chopped him up and buried the pieces around the mansion. And the Ohio version is quite similar to the Michigan one. There once was a mysterious man only known as Dr. Crow who was said to have performed unusual experiments specifically on orphan children. One of these experiments created the melon heads. These children with malformed bodies and large hairless heads eventually escaped and killed Crow and now they roam the forest feeding on babies. The Grassman is a large humanoid creature that resembles Bigfoot who is said to reside in the woods of Ohio, but unlike Bigfoot, the Grassman is supposedly much more aggressive. The creature received its name from various adventurers claiming to have seen their huts made of tall grass. The first notable sighting of the Grassman was in Minerva, Ohio in August 1978. Some children who were staying with their grandparents at the time wandered into the woods while playing before they bursted back into the house screaming about a tall monster covered in hair. The grandparents stepped out outside to see just what exactly the kids were so afraid of. And right in front of their eyes was the grass man, covered in dark matted hair digging through a trash can. The couple estimated that the creature was easily over 300 pounds. The elderly couple went on to encounter the grass man on several other occasions, and on the third sighting, they made a connection. Just a few days before the very first sighting, the couple's German shepherd was found with its neck broken. The two now suspected that this creature living in the woods was responsible. Apparently, there were also Native American stories dating back to the 1700s where they spoke of a race of ape-like men who they refer to as wild ones of the woods. And in an attempt to keep the peace with the creatures, they would offer them food as well as other resources. So that's going to end part 13. Thank you all so much for making it all the way to the end. If you enjoyed the video, leaving behind a like would really help me out. And apologies for a shorter addition to the Unsolved Mysteries series. I've just been preoccupied with some more back-end work in the last couple of weeks on the channel since I've been looking to bring on several additional people, including an editor, which I am still looking for a short-form editor. So if you're interested, I have my email on my about page on the channel. So go ahead and shoot me an email if you're interested and have experience in that. And 
before I end the video, I want to give a special thank you as always to all of my wonderful channel members for supporting me every single month. Thank you so much to Jerome Reuter, 0 to 9, minus 5 stars, Sasha Wise, Fear the Milkman, Devoured Eagle, Hero, Fartbag69, <laughs> Dooney vs. The World, Oscar Isaacson, My Name Matt, and Melody. It really means a lot that you guys became members to support me, so thank you so much. And I do see a few new names in there, so welcome. And if any of you guys would like to see your name at the beginning and end of my videos, as well as get early access to my videos, check out the description. They'll give you some details on becoming a member. And make sure to visit the link in the description if you're interested in today's sponsor, Scentbird. So with all that being said, stay safe, and I hope you guys all have an amazing day.